Real Estate Investing Profits presents Profit Masters with your host, world-renowned real estate coach and investor, Corey Boatwright. Now, strap in and get ready to learn elite wealth-building investment strategies taught by six- and seven-figure house-flipping masters as they reveal their best real estate investing profit secrets to you right now. All right, we made it here. My name is Corey Boatwright. And I'm the founder of Real Estate Investing Profits, and we are kicking off our very first podcast for our Real Estate Investing Profits Profit Master Series with none other than a friend of mine and a mastermind that uh, I've been involved in for quite some time now called The Collective Genius with my good buddy Jason Medley. Our guest today is Jason Hartman. And Jason has actually done multiple millions of dollars in real estate investing. He's been involved in thousands of real estate transactions. He actually has owned income properties in 11 states and 17 cities. And Jason is someone that I think you're going to get a lot of value from. And so you want to make sure that you have... Um, something to take notes on. And if you don't, don't worry about it because everything is going to be inside the show notes. Also, if you want to go ahead and text right now, if you're on a phone, just text PROFIT, P-R-O-F-I-T, which is 38470, 38470. Just text the word PROFIT and that way you'll make sure that you're on a real estate investing profit uh, list and we will get you over our free real estate guide. It's called the Ultimate Real Estate Investing Guide: How to Quit Your Job and Flip Houses in 90 Days or Less. And you don't have to even worry about opting in with an email. If you just go ahead and text, we'll go ahead and get it over to you. Okay, so this interview is it's about 34, 35 minutes long, and Jason. And I just go over some of the top questions that really you want to know about. So thank you again for being a part of our podcast series. I'm super excited about bringing you all of the real estate rock stars and our profit masters and none other way to go ahead and kick off our series with Jason Hartman. So here you go. Hey, Jason, what's going on? Hey, Corey, how you doing? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. Now, where are you calling in from? I am in La Jolla, California. Wow, it's beautiful over there. I love La Jolla. I've been there several, several times. In fact, I love going to La Jolla for just like a couple of days to have friends around there and then jetting over like five or six hours to Maui because it's so close. <laughs> well, I wouldn't say it's that close, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> five hours. That's not too yeah. far to get to paradise to me. Yeah, it's, I, I guess it's the last step before you have to go swimming. So yeah, <laughs> fair enough. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Well, hey, thanks for coming on here. I really appreciate it. Obviously, we have uh, released our uh, Profit Masters series for real estate investing profits. And I know that you're a veteran at um, this podcasting business. And so definitely a lot of things to, to learn from you. One of the ways that you and I learned actually is at the Collective Genius Mastermind. And I know a little bit about your story, but I'd like for you to go ahead and explain in your own words, Jason, on a little bit who you are and what is your real estate ex expertise or kind of how you're involved in real estate investing right now for our listeners. Yeah, sure. I first got to ask for those listeners on video, do you like my big giant microphone? It's <laughs> like a, it's like a, it's an alien head looking it's, at me. I love this it. thing is new. I've got to get me it, one of those. Mine looks I, so it's I, different. I think it makes it sound better. So anyway, I've got marble floors and not enough. Uh, it looks like a, it looks like there's like a universe thing. and that's like a a, a, a moon or something. Yeah. <laughs> I know. I'm really just into like the planets and this is part of my solar system model. <laughs> I want, this I want is the Pluto, the black planet. The black you know, we, just, we just got near Pluto. So 7,000 miles away from Pluto. So here's Pluto right here, buddy. I like, I like it. You got yeah. the mic flag too. Is that what it is? Yeah. A mic flag on that's there? That's a mic flag I'm right going to get one. I'm going to get a yeah. real estate investing profits, pro, uh, yeah. profit master mic flag right here. Yep. yep. You need to do that. Yeah. Got to do More it. power to you. So anyway, to answer your question, um, I got into real estate when I was at the ripe old age of 19 years old. Uh, I saw an infomercial when I was 16, 
grew up poor, didn't like that very much. So I thought I want to I want to have financial success in my life and um, started selling real estate for Century 21 when I was in college, just part time and uh, did a lot with investors, HUD and VA repos and stuff like that in, mm -hmm. in bad areas. And um, after I did that, I became uh, successful as an agent, bought my first rental property when I was 20. I've done a lot of flips in my life, a lot of buy and hold. And at this point, Corey, I really believe in the buy and hold strategy. Gotcha. The, thing I've, uh, the thing I've really found over the years is that the people who flip properties, they have spending money, mm -hmm. but the people who buy and hold have the real wealth. And, uh, you know, they're both good. Spending money is great. Real wealth is better, I think. And, uh, and so the buy and hold thing is, uh, is, is really my specialty. And the distinction is that I do it nationwide. Right. I believe that income property is the most historically proven asset class in the world. But you got to diversify geographically because all real estate is local. And you want to be in at least three to five markets nationwide. And um, uh, that's uh, that's really my specialty. I got gotcha. you. So, and also, I know you're being a little humble about this, but you have a number one ranked podcast real estate investing show out there right now. And you also, it's not just, I mean, you have investors for hard money and lending. And in that space, um, it, it works well with that within that synergy. So buy and hold is where your big focus is right now, Jason. Right, yeah, and that's what I teach on the Creating Wealth show. I've been uh, I've been running that show for about nine years that's now, incredible. Yeah, and uh, and uh, it's just been a great thing. And yeah, it's always up in the top few real estate podcasts. So uh, I love doing it. And uh, one of the great things about that is that when you teach something, it forces you to learn it better. I agree. And so I co of course did a lot of public speaking and still do. And um, you know the audience challenges you; they ask you really tough questions. And um, it makes you really a better investor, I think, because it, it causes you to get really curious about stuff and learn how to answer those questions and uh, solve those problems. So, yeah. I agree. What made you want to get involved in real estate investing? Just a quick summary. What was the motivation? You know, I, I, well, at first it was just, you know, make money, right? <laughs> right, when I was, right. When I was 16. Uh, but then after that, what I realized after my first two real estate deals is the incredible power uh, that the uh, the late great mathematician and physicist uh, shared with the world, and that's Archimedes. Mm -hmm. You know, this is what about 20, 2,300 years ago, maybe Archimedes walked the earth, mm -hmm. and he talked a lot about leverage, Corey. Right. And uh, one of his famous quotes is, "Give me a lever long enough, and I will move the entire world." Wow. And at any area of our life where we want to be successful. Uh, we need to gain leverage. And uh, so leverage could come in the form of knowledge and personal growth. It co could come in the pr uh, form of, you know, better communication skills so we can have better relationships. Uh, in real estate, financial leverage comes in the form of OPM or other people's money. Right. Uh, certainly, I know all your listeners have heard about leverage and other people's money and all of that stuff. But uh, if we drill down a little deeper into it, which I'm happy to do, time permitting, uh, there, there's really more to it than just the power of the fact that you can have you you can do things at like five times the speed. You know, it's it's kind of like if you've ever stood and uh, certainly people have you know in a bright light, uh, maybe the sunlight as the sun is setting or rising, and it's casting your shadow, and your shadow looks really big. Right. And what if your shadow was five times larger than you? And that's the leverage pretty much everybody has the ability to get on a real estate deal because you can put, say, 20% down and the bank will put in 80% of the money. Sure. So you can control five times as much. Incredible. You have a five to one leverage ratio. And so that allows you to be five times bigger than you really are. <laughs> and, and, and real estate is very powerful just from that perspective alone. But there are many other multi-dimensional benefits to income property as an asset class. I agree with that totally. And, you know, thinking about right now where we are with interest rates being as low as I think I've ever seen them. I mean, it's incredible time to leverage right now. There's a story for some of our 
Risk Profit Masters uh, for real estate, which is what you are, Jason. Some of them have a story of there's a breaking point in their lives. Did you have one of those where it was just enough is enough and you needed to do something different and you saw real estate was one of those leverage opportunities for you? Right. Well, you know, I've had many slumps and hard times in business over the years. I mean, I'd I'd be lying if I told you I hadn't. There have certainly been many, many big challenges uh, in my life. But, but, you know, just to not get on too much of a tangent here, but that's really, uh, you know, if you want to think of that from a positive perspective, that's a measure of the person. You know, the, the bigger the problems you are handed and the bigger the problems you can overcome, mm-hmm. the bigger person you are. Okay, so uh, you know the late Norman Vincent Peale used to say, you know, he used to throw up his hands and say, "God, give me a problem, give me a bigger problem." Right. And uh, and and really, that was all about uh, showing that he could overcome bigger bigger things. I mean, you know, people that are doing big things financially, they're taking big risk, and man, they have big problems. Okay. People that have small problems, they have a small life. Okay. So, you know, that's maybe a good way to look at it. But, uh, you know, I've always been in real estate. It's really been my only career. So I can't say that, like maybe some of your other guests, you know, I was working a nine to five day job and I was in a cubicle and I just got fed up with my boss and got into real estate. That's not my story because... Uh, my story is grew up, uh, grew up kind of with very limited resources, Los Angeles, California. Uh, and, um, I, uh, I just didn't want to live that way as an adult. So financial success was important to me, uh, from a very early age. Yeah. She just wanted something, um, you saw it, you saw it from a different standpoint, uh, even, even as young as you were, what was one of your biggest influences for investing? Curious. Well, the first influence was Robert Allen, okay. because when I was 16 years old, I saw his infomercial. Sure. And you know, Robert Allen is kind of a mixed bag, honestly, but uh, not around uh, the same time of Carlton Sheets. It's kind of in that same. Yeah. Well, background. he was before, I, yeah, think, I don't before. know. Carlton Sheets was around a long time. Maybe he was around then. I don't know. But, yeah. um, but Robert Allen, I saw his infomercial. I went out and got his book, Nothing Down, which I believe was his first book. I read three chapters of it, put it down. My mom picked it up and, uh, she read the whole thing. I was only 16. Okay. I didn't finish anything at that age <laughs> except my driving test. You know, I had to learn how to drive a car so I could go on dates <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, You know, my mom picked up the book, and by the time I was 18, she she said, you know, Jason, you got me interested in this real estate stuff. There's a big seminar in Anaheim by Disneyland this weekend. Why don't you go? Gotcha. And so I went, and, uh, you know, the first speaker I saw was a guy named Hal Morris. Maybe you've heard that name. And uh, he was talking about points. And I thought, what is a point? I don't know what he's talking about. I was only 18. And uh, I, I remember Earl Nightingale telling me a year earlier, because I had discovered Earl Nightingale uh, in listening to all of his, his great work. And he said, you know, if you want to get rich in real estate, learn the business first. Right. So that Monday, I got busy looking for how do I get into real estate school and get my license so I could just humbly learn the business. And uh, both the business... And the investments, you know, really, those are two separate tracks in a way, right? I agree. Uh, they've both been wonderful uh, for my financial life. I know it hasn't always been wonderful, though, right? There's been, a, there's have to been one or two deals that were like your mistakes or your worst oh, deal. Definitely. I'd like to find out about, can you describe maybe one of those and how you got through it? Yes. Uh, Palm's Place. Wow, Before you I was the really, name. In, yes, uh, yes, I will name names, those rotten scumbags. <laughs> Just my opinion, okay? <laughs> Don't sue me. Um, but uh, anyway, uh, before I was an investor, I, you know, a lot of people, I want to make this distinction, a lot of people call themselves investors, Corey, right. but they're really not investors. Okay. They're really just gamblers and speculators. And I've been guilty of that too, okay? Sure. I really wasn't what I would today call an investor until about 11 years ago. What is, what is that difference? Really okay. quickly, what is the differentiation? Great question. The distinction, at least for me, you know, different people have different opinions about this, but my distinction of an investor is investors invest for cash flow and return on investment. Okay. Whereas gamblers and speculators, they invest for capital gains and appreciation. And the reason I think that's important is that uh, appreciation is very unreliable. 
And I have never, and I, I kind of think you might agree with me on this, although I've never talked with you about it. I have never, ever met a person who can reliably predict appreciation. Yet cash flow is, it's pretty reliable. Okay. Good, so, good um, point. That's real good you know, point. that's, you know, investing is about the creating value over time. Mm -hmm. It's about getting a return on investment without a lot of uh, attention to the deal. If you're flipping properties, you are not an investor. You are in the business of real estate, and you can make a lot of money that way. I'm a More hybrid, I think. You. I think I'm a hybrid. I, yeah, I flip properties, hybrid, and yeah. then I, and I think a lot of people are. I have a portfolio of properties, and but I still see, I think sometimes uh, the, the hybrid approach works because you want that immediate cash flow. Sure. Um, right. Yeah. Well, it's not cash flow. It's capital gain. Capital gain. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. So, so the the um, uh, that's a hybrid approach. So you can be in the business of flipping, but when we talk about investing, that term to me means something that doesn't require a lot of attention. Right. Something that you set it and you don't forget it. You can't do that. You've got to pay attention to everything, or you're going to lose money. Right. Okay. And um, uh, and you invest for an overall return on the investment, monthly cash flow and income and all of the other stuff that comes with it, but you don't rely on appreciation. That is where it becomes speculative. Speculative. That's a good point. I, I don't think I've ever heard anybody distinguish it like that. I, I would also say wholesalers are also assigners. You're not going to have a capital gain for that, but eventually that's kind of the, the game as you want to start flipping Wholesaling properties. is a business. Yeah. Real estate investing with income property is an investment. Good, good point. Flipping is a business. Uh, buying and holding is an investment. It's just a different thing. I mean, it's you know, it, it could be a great business, but I'm not talking to you about business really. I'm talking to you about investing. Right. Okay, Jason. So that's great. I, I love that differentiation. Um, so one of the things that we talk about is a profit master investing strategy and our guests share kind of one of their best ones that's working for them right now. What would you say is a profit master investing strategy that you could share uh, with our audience? Well, in the buy and hold side of this, there are many principles. And one of the things I talk about a lot on my show and at my seminars is something I call the 10 commandments of successful investing. Ten and so the first one I definitely want to share with your listeners, and I, I think most of your listeners We'll just get this right away. And that is commandment number three. Okay. And that is thou shalt maintain control. I love that. Okay. When, when you relinquish control of your money and you invest in a fund, a Wall Street investment, uh, anything that you don't directly control, I believe in being a direct investor. And I know most of your listeners already probably agree with this. Okay. Being a direct investor, you leave yourself susceptible to three major problems. Number one, you might be investing with a crook. Number two, you might be investing with an idiot. Mm. And number three, assuming they're honest and competent, they take a huge management fee off the top for managing the deal. Right. So be a direct investor. I know that sounds incredibly simple, and many people listening to your show already believe in that, okay? So let me give you something at the opposite end of the spectrum that's sort of an advanced technique okay. for wealth creation, which very few people really understand. Okay. And this is a mouthful. I call it inflation-induced debt destruction. Wow. Say that 10 times fast. Inflation-deduced debt? Induced. Induced. Yeah. <laughs> it's a stumper. Inflation-induced debt destruction. Debt okay. destruction. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> yeah. So inflation-induced debt destruction is like the hidden wealth creator, Corey, that most people don't even understand is making them wealthy behind the scenes. When most people buy a property, they think, okay, I'm going to buy it, and uh, then I'll sell it later, and it will have appreciated. Sure. But that appreciation is mostly in what's called nominal dollars. It's not really in real dollars, because when you adjust for inflation, real estate doesn't really appreciate that well. It's okay. It's just not incredible, okay? Um, but Yeah, when there's you a lot of hype about inflation, yeah. right? There, there's definitely a lot and of a pre appreciation or other. Yeah. yeah. So when, when you leverage that investment and you use OPM, you get a multiplier of that appreciation and that makes it a lot better. So say, for example, the real estate appreciates at 3%, but 
but you've got a five to one leverage ratio, that means you're really going to get a 15% return. Right. Three times five. Right. Okay. Uh, ver so that helps you beat inflation. And that's why real estate is a great hedge against inflation. But here's the beauty. Here's the beauty that's happening behind the scenes that most people don't understand. They think they get rich because the real estate appreciates. But one of the hidden wealth creators, inflation-induced debt destruction, is they get rich because not only does the tenant pay off your loans and your financing, right. because we outsource our debt to our tenants, okay? Right. Outsourcing they're, they're is a great They're making the technique. payment, right. They're making the payment. They're paying down the loan for us. But not only that, inflation is paying down the loan for us, too. Okay, so let me give you an example lest you and your listeners think this is some like esoteric theory that's way out there in space, out here by the planets. Okay, I'm, for you listening and not watching the video, I'm, I'm holding my big giant globe microphone. Pluto, Pluto. Yeah. It's Pluto, it's Pluto. <laughs> the black planet, planet here, planet X. Yeah, so um, this actually happened to tens of millions of people, Corey. Tens of millions of people. Here's the example. In 1971, we went completely off the gold standard when Richard Nixon closed the gold window. And at that point, it allowed government to become incredibly irresponsible in its spending. Right. And of course, it caused the misery index of the terrible uh, Jimmy Carter era in the 70s, and there, where there was uh, stagflation, which means that's a very bad economic malady because you have inflation and high unemployment at the same time and no, no growth in salaries, okay, and wages. And so it's an awful, awful economic malady. But real estate investors became very rich during that time because here's what happened. In 1972, one year after we went off the gold standard, if you went and bought the median price single family home, you would have paid $18,000 for it. Okay. With 20% down, you would have borrowed about $14,000. I'm rounding all this off. Sure, sure. Just for speed. Okay. And in 1972, a dollar was worth a dollar. But if you got a 30 year mortgage in the middle of 1972, you would have paid an average, a typical rate would have been about 7.3% on that mortgage. Okay, and rates are lower now. Like you said, it's amazing, right? Yeah, amazing. We're talking, you know, 40 years ago or something, right? And rates are lower today. But anyway, uh, by that time, by the time you made the last payment on that mortgage in 2001, okay, in 2001, three decades later, you had a three decade fixed rate loan and you lived in this house. You didn't even rent it. You didn't get any rental income from it. That house would have made you so rich because that $1972 by 2001 was only worth 24 cents. Right. Good point. Right. And in nominal dollars, wow. on that $14,000 mortgage, you repaid about 14 or th I'm sorry, about $36,000. But, but in real dollars, you only repaid about $12,000, or sorry, $16,000, 16,000 real dollars, but after tax benefits from a house you occupied that you actually got paid to live in, okay, you only repaid $12,000. So you thought you were paying 7.37% on that rate. When actually. really, you got paid to borrow right, that money. Right. You got paid 1.16% to borrow it, and as a free bonus, you got to live in that home for three decades for free. That's, that's the beauty of real estate. I mean, that's and Corey, incredible. this is not a theory. Right. This no, actually happened to tens of millions of people. Why do you think the baby boomer generation became so wealthy? That's how they did it. They owned real estate. They bought a house. That's, that's, that's the secret. Now, the really smart ones bought rental property. Right. They bought income property. And they multiplied that dramatically. But just buying your own house. Over, and, and we didn't even have, over the 30 years, that much inflation. Mm -hmm. Because the average inflation rate over the three decades was only 5.1%. It wasn't that high. Of course, during the Jimmy Carter era, it got up to you know, the official stat of over 13%. But, I mean, it's just an unbelievable thing. This is called inflation-induced 
debt destruction. I've never heard the term before. Because I made it up. It's incredible. my little trademark term. I love inflation it. Inflation induced debt destruction. I yeah. love it. And I love the story behind it. Jason, yeah. what do you think is one piece of advice that you would give somebody for running a successful real estate business? Just just a quick little tidbit that you, you could share. A business or an investment? I think in, that's a good point. Probably a an business. Investment, probably, uh, right? I, I, I would say oh, go, go oh. with each, a business and an investment. Well, for business, you know, develop a brand, okay? Definitely you've got to develop a brand. So, that, you know, a brand is a form of shorthand, right. okay? It, 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 it's sort of an instant trust, an instant verification with the consumer. So, you know, there's lots of books on, on branding and so forth. But, you know, one very simplistic way to develop a brand is, uh, you know, keep your promises and be a good citizen and take care of your customers and, uh, and, and that and sort of... And take care of your customers and take uh, care yeah. of your customers yeah. and take care of your customers. <laughs> this, this should be pretty obvious, right? right? But unfortunately, in today's world, it's, 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 it's not that it's obvious not. <laughs> sometimes. So, so that's one thing. And then the other thing is... Uh, you've got to develop systems, I love okay? That. And you've got to create some sort of system. So really there are two ways to really be successful in business. One way is you sell a high ticket item like real estate and you take care of a few good customers and, you know, a few might be a few hundred, hopefully, uh, and you can make a lot of money because it's a high ticket item, Okay. But the other way is you sell a low ticket item like, uh, you know, apps for a smartphone, for example, right? Sure, sure. And, uh, you know, maybe the app is a dollar and uh, you sell a lot of them. So when you sell a low ticket item, you've got to focus on systems and scalability. When you sell a high ticket item, you just got to focus on service and in both areas, you got to focus on reputation and brand. I agree with that. I uh, I used to sell Ginsu knives on eBay. I sold ten thousand Ginsu knives a month. We had to sell you so sold many. Ginsu I sold knives? Ginsu knives on eBay. They're hilarious. Those, I had one, no idea. Those ones that you you cut a knife and uh, you cut a can in half. Yeah. So the, the real one, Ginsu brand. The, the real Ginsu brand. I I I basically got a ton of them out of Japan. And um, <laughs> I had no it, idea. I sold them for a cent. There's a whole story, but I don't want to go into it. Uh, all my competitors were selling for five dollars and ninety nine cents. I came in and started selling mine at one cent on a Dutch auction and charged uh, seven dollars and nine dollars for shipping and started blew my competitors out of the water uh, selling mine at one cent with ten dollars shipping basically. But then I moved into plasma TVs to to your point because I could just sell one or two big plasma TVs, which at the time was they like more expensive, ten right? fifteen thousand dollars, wow. and make a three or four thousand dollar profit from those, right. yeah. and it changed everything. So I agree one hundred percent with you. Uh, whenever you're talking about doing a volume play, yeah, you have to sell obviously more of it. Jason, you, what you if you got to be at scale? But Corey, I yeah. want to just say one thing because you alluded to another big secret there. Okay, when you talked about um, when you talked about selling uh, the knives, right, and the and the and the TV. Oh, what the heck was I going to say about that? Oh, it was the the Dutch auction, right? The Dutch it's auction. The, you see, another big secret. Some people probably is, don't even know what that is. <laughs> yeah, and and it's a that's like a reverse auction, right? right yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, but uh, one of the big one of the big secrets you just alluded to was have a unique business model. Right. Okay, business model is kind of in the area of systems, but not exactly. And so you've got to have a unique business model and uh, not a me too business model. It's very hard to compete in the me too world. The worst thing that can happen to any business is to be considered a commodity. That is the worst thing. You do not want to be considered a commodity. So you've got to have a unique business model. And that may take some real thinking. Okay, it you know really may take some thinking in new directions, but if you look at all these really innovative sharing economy companies, they call it the sharing economy, right. and those would include Airbnb, Lyft, Uber. Uh, you know there are all these you know cars to go. Right. Um, all of these types of sharing economy concepts. Those are really unique business models, they and are. they're flourishing, obviously. So I, I love that, and the interesting thing about Uber is they don't own taxis, so. I really, but they're a taxi company. And Airbnb so. doesn't have a single doesn't own, hotel it, room. Doesn't own any real estate. Doesn't own any yeah. hotel. But they're they're a real estate company. I I, I like that. What's uh, they're, one? They're, uh, Corey, Corey, they're the biggest hotelier in the world. They now have the same market cap as I believe Hilton, and they don't own a single room. Isn't that amazing? That, That's incredible. Let that, That's let, the power of a business model. Let that sink in. The power of a business model. Really? If you had to start over, Jason. Uh, we're going to blaze through a few more questions here. Um, I appreciate you taking the time on this. If you had to start over, and this is some advice from maybe somebody new, what would you change? 
Well, I would certainly have purchased a lot more property. <laughs> I, you know, I've come to realize something. You can't own enough real estate. <laughs> it's just, it's, it's, it is the most proven thing. And, you know, I'd say one of my big downfalls is, uh, this is going to sound really weird, uh, but it's creativity. You know, I, I'm, I'm really intrigued and curious about new ideas and mm -hmm. creative things. And every time I go into these creative things and new things and, you know, I just go back to the trusty, wonderful real estate. You know, all these other creative things, those are like your mistress, okay? That's going to get you into trouble. <laughs> you know, yes. it's exciting. Now, listen, I'm not married and I've never had a mistress, okay? <laughs> but I'd like to be disclaimer, married. Disclaimer, disclaimer. And, and I'd like to think I would be a faithful husband, okay? <laughs> but, so ladies, but, you know, Jason is available. <laughs> that's right, definitely available. And, um, you know, but, but like your wife is that de dependable, uh, good person, right? Right. Right. And the mistress is all these crazy things you go after and you get yourself into trouble with. So, you know, it's just kind of a funny analogy. But, it is. I, um, I, I think that's good, though. It's a great, it's a great analogy. What's your favorite man, motivational? Real, real estate is the most dependable thing ever. It's just, it just rules. You know, it really does. Yeah. What's your favorite motivational or business quote? Ooh, uh, there are too many to choose, first I, of all. It's really it's impossible. It's, it's like time. asking a parent who's their favorite kid, okay? But I'll take a stab and I'll, I'll give a really simple one. It, this, is, this is a Zen saying, and it says, to know and not to do is to not yet know. Wow. And I think that really speaks to the paralysis of analysis. Mm. And that person who is forever uh, doing what I call getting ready to get ready, mm -hmm. they know everything. You can't out talk this person. They've been to every seminar. Right. They've read every book. They know every guru, yet they don't do anything. Mm. And I say to know and not to do is to not yet know. They don't know because they're not doing. Tim Ferriss says a low information diet. Yeah, uh, right. I, I think that's that kind of goes right along with that. Jason, yeah. what um, what's book? What's a book you recommend, or more than one? Maybe one that's really impacted you. Yeah. Well, again, too many, <laughs> but uh, but you know, what's your favorite I, I, kid, Jason? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So you know, I definitely love the late Stephen Covey's work, "The Seven okay. Habits of Highly Effective People." I, like I, I know everybody's into yeah, it, and they've I all like said it. it. And it is it is really a seminal work. It's brilliant. But let me give you one your listeners maybe haven't heard of, and you can actually get this one on Amazon. Okay. It's it's like expensive, kind of, because there aren't many in print. Okay. But it's brilliant. It's full of nuggets. I love it. And Corey, it's called Earl Nightingale's Greatest Discovery. Greatest Discovery. I've never Earl read Nightingale's that. Greatest Discovery. And it's not The Strangest Secret, which is the one that made him super famous many, many years ago. But Earl Nightingale's Greatest Discovery. Of course, Atlas Shrugged by Ayn Rand. Sure. Brilliant. Um, there are just so many great books out there, obviously. But those are, those are a couple of them. That's great. Okay. What's a favorite app that you use on business uh, every day? Wait a sec. One more book. Okay. Mission Success by Og Mandino. Mission Success. By the late Og Mandino. Brilliant. Wonderful. Incredible. Okay. Yeah. What's a uh, mobile app that you use every day, Jason? Oh, God. You know what I really love now? Oh, I love this one. <laughs> I'm, I've only been into this one for about two weeks. What is it? It's right there. It's Voxer. Voxer. Good old oh. Voxer. Man. What do you like I, about Voxer so much? You know what? It's like... Um, they recently just added video, by the way. You oh, can, I... They did. I they just I, recently yeah, I made I, it. Yeah, I, I think I read that. I yep. haven't used that yet. Made but, an update. Uh, yep. But Voxer is really cool because it's like texting with voice and you can have sort of conversations like you're in the same room together, mm -hmm. but they can be... The beauty is, if you look at communication techniques, you know, basically before we had the phone, right? Mm -hmm. We had in-person conversations on the phone, and those were what's called synchronous. Mm -hmm. In other words, you and I have to be talking real-time, Corey. Right. But then email was really the first major asynchronous mm -hmm. communication form where mm -hmm. we could not be there at the same time. You could... Send me something when it's convenient for you. I could respond when it's convenient for me. And that revolutionized communication in many ways. But um, the beauty of, with Voxer is it can be either synchronous or asynchronous, right. just depending on the availability of the other party. And you don't have to establish that availability in advance. It's on the fly. 
So it's a it's a pretty cool little app. I, I really do like it. It is cool. It's only uh, I think it's free for a little bit, and then you can only like a couple of bucks if you want to get a. a it, pro it's it's of it. actually free, and if you want a pro account, it's thirty bucks a year. Big deal, right? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thirty whole dollars a year. Woo. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, well. Yeah. It's a little investment, and and you can get a lot out of it. I, that's a good one. I like Boxer. What's your morning routine? Do you have one, Jason? You know, I don't have a really good morning routine, um, but I uh, I get up and I drink coffee, <laughs> and I drink a uh, Bullet, special kind of bulletproof coffee. coffee or no, not bulletproof death coffee. Death because, Wish coffee or any kind of. No, it's too hard to make. Um, so I don't drink. I've done bulletproof before, but um, I drink um, this one I buy on Amazon. It's just instant coffee, and it's fairly good. It's called Instant Edge. Instant and uh, it's got the MCT oil in it, and oh, then I add cool. a little coconut oil from Trader Joe's to that. Nice. And, okay. Uh, then I had MCT in it. That's cool. Yeah. Okay. Um, what's the single greatest lesson that you've learned, and like to maybe help get where you are today? Just just quickly, something that you've learned that you can say, man, when I learned that, that helped me get to my where I am today. I, I feel like uh, some things I've taught you about. You're a really successful investor, and you weren't always there, but there had to be something that is a lesson or something that, that took you there. Oh gosh. I mean, there are so many, of course. Uh, so the question really is it in the business or investing spectrum, but let me give you an investing example. Okay. Uh, one thing that really, really helped. Okay. And I discovered this, uh, by accident and I call it the Hartman risk evaluator. Now it's kind of one of my trademark things like the inflation induced debt destruction okay. uh, concept. And basically what it, tells us to do as investors is to invest in low land value areas. Low land value, okay. So that we're basically, like one of the funny things I say, Corey, is that I don't even like real estate. I'm really a commodities investor okay. because when you look at the ingredients of a house or an apartment complex, you're, you're investing in, in commodities. You're investing in concrete, lumber, right. steel, glass, petroleum products, copper wire, mm -hmm. uh, all of these things, right? You're investing in energy. And granted, those things do go up and down for sure. But the thing we know is that everybody on planet Earth needs to consume those commodities. Right. We also know they have intrinsic value. They're not attached to any one currency. And I want to buy those commodities, if I can, at below their replacement cost. Right. And if not below their replacement cost, I want to get them very close to their replacement cost. Sure. And um, I don't want to be an investor in land because land, honestly, now Will Rogers has this great quote. He says, buy land, they're not making any more of it, right? Sure, I've heard it many and, times. And you know, right. on, on its face, that sounds like a good quote, but, but really, it's not really very true, okay? Because there's lots of land left, okay? You know, they're, they're, you fly over the country, fly around the earth, there's tons of land. Now, granted, it's not all desirable, but there's a lot of land. It's undeveloped, but right, and, yeah. And, and land doesn't really, nobody really knows the value of land. But mm. we do know the value of those commodities. Even though they fluctuate, admittedly, they have an intrinsic value. And everybody on earth, every human being, has three common needs. Food, clothing, and shelter. Sure. And let them rent that shelter from you. Own those commodities. Own the commodities. I love yep. that. Okay, Be a so commodities investor, but finance those commodities with three decade fixed rate uh, mortgages that you outsource to somebody else. This is what I part of what I call the ultimate investing equation, which okay. is another thing we probably don't have time for. Maybe that's for another show. Yeah. <laughs> well, at the end here, I'm going to give uh, a couple some folks or the listeners a way to get in touch with you because you've, I mean, you've you've dropped some nuggets. I've I've written probably a half a page in notes. And those are just on what I have the time to write down. So this I'll is, tell you something. In our mastermind group, Corey, you are definitely a good note taker. I'm, I'm a great <laughs> note taker. I've got I, I take a lot of great notes. Okay, let me ask you um, something else here. If you know, let me just ask you a simple question. What you what are you most grateful for? Just simply, what are you most grateful for now? You know, I, I I'm that's such a tough question to answer because I think gratitude is so critically important. Mm -hmm. I don't think anybody can achieve success without gratitude. And I, I'll tell you why, by the way. That's, that's good. I, I will answer your question. I'm not a politician. I actually do answer the questions, hopefully. But the important thing is, the opposite of gratitude is entitlement, hmm. okay? And entitlement is this like chip on the shoulder that says the world owes me something. Hmm. 
And with that attitude, going around with that type of attitude, you can never achieve success because you'll always feel slighted. And the opposite of that is to feel grateful. So I'm grateful for so many things. I'm grateful for the people in my life, the lessons I've learned. I'm grateful for my health. I'm grateful for, and this is maybe an odd one, my curiosity. You know, I'm, I, I feel like I'm a very curious person and I'm, I'm grateful for sure. that. Sure. Uh, even though it does lead me to have affairs with mistresses, like we, you know, <laughs> I'm going back to the example oh, no. <laughs> that I, I talked about. Metaphorically, not metaphorical real, mistresses, metaphorical not mistresses. Not real mistresses. <laughs> it's just an analogy I made. If you just tuned in, okay. You know. Yeah, someone just tuning in right now. They're like, what kind of podcast like, what is a this? What jerk is this? This guy is a scumbag. <laughs> yeah. listen, listen, I'll tell you, if Taylor Swift was my wife, I would never, ever cheat. Okay. okay. All right. So I got to <laughs> reel us back in here. Let, let me ask you this. At what point would you recommend hiring a mentor or somebody that's, uh, that's been important to your success? When, when would you say is a good time to do that? I have a, well, many, I many folks ask, ask about that. I don't know if you really need to hire that person, honestly. I mean, sure you can, it would be great to have a coach mm -hmm. and all that kind of stuff, but you know, those, those mentors and coaches can be expensive. Okay. Sure. Yeah. So maybe a lot of people listening, can't afford that. So you can get those mentors virtually by listening to great podcasts and by uh, listening to audiobooks. TED Talks. Uh, that's a great. TED Talks are good, but you know, those are a lot of those are a lot of those are very leftist. Okay. So watch out for the socialist agenda. Okay. And, and <laughs> oh, the Let's snooty see. socialist agenda. Not that I have an opinion about that or anything. But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> politics aside. Uh, oh my God. Uh, yeah, here we go. Uh, don't get me started on that one. But um Mistresses but, and politics. Let's just yeah. keep this, let's just keep it on real estate investing. <laughs> Corey, let's Fine. Who else can we offend? I don't know. Okay. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we haven't talked about Donald Trump yet or Obama. I mean, we're doing well, okay so Well, far. that's easy. Obama sucks. <laughs> Um, although he's done a few decent things, but Trump he, is memorable right terrible. now. You give it, Trump give, is memorable. He, he, I mean, he, I can't say he's a great entertainer and he's a, yeah, uh, anyway. Trump, Trump is a, he's a, he's an arrogant jerk, but I don't know. It's hard to disagree. Hey, it's with refreshing to hear someone at least say what they, what yeah. they, what they feel, even if he's not necessarily pol politically correct on everything. It's refreshing. Yeah, it is refreshing. I, I will admit, you know, given the fact that we've, uh, you know, no one seems to tell the truth anymore, unfortunately. So, you know. So on, on the mentoring and the coaching, I agree that you don't have to pay for it. When is a good time to kind of introduce that into your life? I know a lot of times folks start out. Immediately. I agree. I, I think have those right away. Sooner, I mean, listen, sooner than later. I'll tell you something. Like when, when, I was, when I was 16, 17 years old, I was going down the wrong road. I didn't have good influences. Mm -hmm. I was destined to get myself into trouble. I, if, totally if this you. one thing didn't happen, if uh, I didn't get Zig Ziglar's book, See You at the Top, oh. with the subtitle, A Checkup from the Neck Up to Eliminate Stinkin' Thinkin' and Avoid Hardening of the Attitudes. Loves it. That book changed my life because it set me on the path. You and go. you know what the next book was that changed my life? It was Dennis Waitley's book, the psychology of winning 10 habits or 10 qualities of a total winner. And I've had Dennis Waitley on my show. He was a, a great mentor. And then it was Earl Nightingale, Jim Rohn. I mean, all of that stuff just changed my life. Les Brown. Yes. Uh, Especially those, Jim Rohn. Jim Rohn's those, yeah. great. They, they were the classics. And I got to tell you, I was lucky enough to go on a speaking tour with Zig Ziglar, where I, I actually shared the stage with him many years ago. Wow. Uh, what an and, opportunity. Uh, That's great. Yeah incredible, you know, and, uh, you know, of course, more contemporary Tony Robbins, and, sure. you know, all, all of those guys, you know, those mentors, you can access their content for free or really inexpensively. So, uh, you know, just, just dive into that stuff. Just make it part of your being, push it into your subconscious mind. You know, we don't get those influences. Jim Rohn said, your income will be the average of the five people you spend most of your time with. And I think that's why it's so important to be in a mastermind group. Because uh, if you if you pick your friends by default by whoever's around, you're just going to have a life by default. You're going to fit into someone else's plan. Uh, you you got to you got to strategically pick your friends. You really do, and that may sound terrible, but it it's important. Because... Look at this, Jason. I mean, you and I met in a mastermind. Now we're a part of a two point nine three million dollar apartment deal that yep. we're looking to right. the close right, and that's from the synergy. That's from working together and 
the connections I have, the connections that you have, I mean, that's just a per prime example. That, that is such a great example, Corey. I'm glad you mentioned it because I, I was, uh, I sold one of my apartment complexes and I, and that one, uh, I had with a, a great partner of mine that I'm doing a 1031 exchange with. And that one sold for $8.6 million, I believe the price was. And I was desperate to find an upleg property for my exchange. And so I found a couple of properties and one of them, literally it came from a post in our private mastermind Facebook group, you and I, yes. you responded, you had a deal and now we're under contract on that deal. So <laughs> it's, perfect example. It's, yeah, it really is. It's uh, co those connections are very valuable. No question. Jason, let me ask you one other question here and then I have uh, you tell people how to get in touch with you. Thank you so much for your time. Um, hey, my pleasure. It's I fun. Really, this has been great. It's, I'm, I've, I've been great. Um, I know our listeners have really enjoyed you too. Uh, Jason, why do you do what you do. What's your why behind this? If you had to summarize, why do you do the podcasting? Do you do this investing as a, as an investor of business? I mean, why, why do you do what you do? Great question. First off, it was money. No question about it. I did not want to live the rest of my life the way I spent my childhood. Okay. Uh, I wanted to be able to take care of the money thing. Okay. But now it's really just more of a mission. You know, I want to share the stuff with other people, the ideas, the uh, example. And, you know, it's kind of a challenge to kind of see how far you can go. Uh, you know, how... Um, like an inner, inner challenge to see how far yeah, you can get. Yeah, yeah. Just, it's, it's just kind of, it's kind of a game after a while, honestly. I agree with that. I mean, I, I live way below my means. I don't spend anywhere near as much as I could. Uh, but, um, you know, it's just, uh, it's just kind of fun. And, and what else are you going to do? I mean, <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I think retirement is an absolutely terrible idea. I agree. Uh, people, you know, it's been proven that people who retire don't live very long. So, uh, so that's not good. You know, you got to keep engaged. You got to be doing stuff. Mm. Um, and, uh, I just love to see ideas spread and put them into the marketplace and, I just love free market economics and uh, and how that whole system works. It's really great. It's such a win-win deal. You know, it's it's amazing to me, Corey, that literally anything we need can be found anywhere on earth through the beauty of free people and free markets. You go on a trip, you've got a place to stay in a hotel or an Airbnb. Yep. You've got food to eat. You've got everything you need is provided for you. And uh, it, it's, it's just such a wonderful system. And uh, it, uh, it just leads to freedom and uh, liberation of the human spirit. So uh, I definitely love capitalism, <laughs> for sure. Hooray for capitalism. Jason, how can we get in touch with you? What's the best way for folks that want to, I want to tell them about your show, I want to find out where the next time you're going to be so they can connect with you. What's the best way to do that? Yeah, so my uh, my real estate website is jasonhartman.com. Just my name, Jason Hartman, H-A-R-T-M-A-N. So jasonhartman.com. Put that in the show notes. Yep, and my podcasting website, I've got a whole uh, a group of podcasts with probably close to 3,000 episodes now and uh, 20 different shows on everything from travel to, uh, you know, offshore investing to, uh, um, yeah, gosh, what else do I have? My, I, my hot new show is called The Longevity and Biohacking Show. Some really amazing things on that show. You can find those all at hartmanmedia.com. Or if you just go to iTunes or Stitcher Radio and type Jason Hartman, all my shows will come up. Well, there you go. Yeah. Jason, I appreciate you for being on here. I've gotten so many notes. I know our listeners have have had to gotten a ton of notes and a lot of value from this. Any final thoughts before we let you go here? No, I just want to wish everybody uh, a lot of success and happy investing and um you know, depending, I don't know where you are in your life, obviously, different people listening are at different places, but you can grow, you can do big things. Um, I'm, I'm a good example of it. I came from pretty much nothing and uh, just uh, got out there and did it. And, uh, you know, I, before I got into the real estate business, I was making minimum wage. I worked in a couple small businesses my mom owned that she struggled with. And, uh, you know, I just... Uh, got out there and, and made it happen. And uh, it's it's amazing how quickly these investments can start to pay off. You know, uh, time will pass anyway, and you might as well put it on your side. Get some real estate under your belt. It's just such a wonderful, uh, faithful uh, investment. And so uh, really, really important. Just, uh, just 
get, get some real estate going in your portfolio. That's the thing to do. Just get it going. All right. Well, I appreciate you so much. Remember, as always, to be a servant. It's one of the ways to have an amazing, fulfilled life. Be a servant leader and be a giver like Jason is. And thank you so much for being a part of the Real Estate Investing Profits Profit Masters podcast. I care about you and I appreciate it and I want to give you as much value as possible. Remember to attend the next podcast and we're going to continue to bring it because you deserve it and I appreciate you so much. Remember, be a servant. Thanks again, Jason. Appreciate you. Thanks, Corey. All right. Bye now. You've been listening to another Real Estate Investing Profits Master Podcast Series. To receive your free real estate book, Down and Dirty, Ultimate Real Estate Investing Quick Start Guide, How to Quit Your Job to Start Flipping Houses in 90 Days or Less, head online and go to realestateinvestingprofits.com. And don't forget to follow us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash realestateinvestingprofits. Thanks again for listening and stay tuned for our next episode.